Um, welcome. I'm Daniel Veneciano, director of the Sheldon Museum of Art. And it is an honor for us at Sheldon to co-sponsor the inaugural Claire M. Hubbard, um, oh gosh, <laughs> First Peoples of the Plains lecture, which is endowed by um, Dr. Ann Hubbard, as well as the Claire Hubbard Foundation. As, as many of you know, we have been celebrating the 50th anniversary of our Philip Johnson building, and so we're delighted to be able to offer this beautiful space um, as a venue for tonight's Hubbard Lecture by Jossie Ross. I hope you had a chance in the last few hours, a couple of hours, to visit the galleries upstairs and uh, see some of the, the great Native American art uh, paintings that we have. Part of our celebration means that we're showcasing our paintings, the treasures from the painting collection, and there you will see uh, a painting by Jean Quictacy Smith by uh, Fritz Schilder, both Native American artists, as well as paintings by Carmen Lomas Garza and Patsy Valdez, Chicana artists. And as you know, Chicano culture uh, celebrates its indigenous roots. Also, just a, just a brief note about um, Sheldon. We have, um, in the past, uh, celebrated contemporary Native American art through exhibitions such as Migrations, New Directions in Native American Art, inviting artists. Marie Watt came a few years ago, did, you may recall, a sewing circle at the Indian Center as well as the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska Center. And we have been actively collecting contemporary Native American art. The photography exhibition Encounters, organized by Brandon Rood, who is here somewhere, uh, featured work that we collected by Hulea uh, Sinogeny. And, and we thank our friends at the Center for the Great, Pl at Great Plains for um, actually organizing an exhibition of her work, which encouraged us and, uh, to, to acquire her work for our collection. Over the summer, we had an exhibition with the work of Jimmy Durham. All of these are um, important American artists um, who happen to be Native American as well, but part of the, the acquisition collections program here at the Sheldon Museum. And it, this will continue, by the way, both Jean Quictacy Smith will be coming here to lecture in February, and Carmen Lomas Garza will be coming in April, so please stay tuned for more programs. And now I would like to um, introduce Priscilla Grew, who is director of the Nebraska State Museum and also a co-sponsor of the events this evening. Uh, two years ago, Dr. Ann Hubbard made possible the renovations of the, uh, the First Peoples of the Plains Gallery at the State Museum, and Priscilla continues uh, her work with Dr. Hubbard to plan university activities to promote greater awareness of Native American culture. Tonight's events, made possible by Dr. Hubbard's gift, are another step in that journey. And, uh, and lastly, I'd like to just recognize that uh, Priscilla had uh, announced her retirement almost about a year ago, I guess it was. We're lucky that she's still here, but I want to recognize the, the 20 years of service that Priscilla has given to the University of Nebraska and the last 10 years to uh, the, the leadership of the State Museum and that uh, the event of th this evening is a testament to her vision and leadership. Please join me in welcoming Priscilla Grew. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, the Sheldon is indeed such a wonderful venue for our campus, and I want to thank you and all the Sheldon staff who's hel who've helped with this event. We've worked with uh, curator Brandon Rood and Sheldon staff, Laurie Seipel, Lindsay Sullivan, and Ed Gradwall. And I've, you won't be getting more, more emails after tonight, which I think it should be a sigh of relief <laughs> than these Philip Johnson walls. Uh, but it does take uh, a large village to pull off something like this. We've had a very active committee uh, working since January to plan uh, the, these events. 
uh, and as director of the New University of Nebraska State Museum, I'd like to add my personal welcome to Daniel's. We're very delighted to co-sponsor the Hubbard Lecture events. Uh, tonight, as Daniel said, is the inaugural event and a new endowed lectureship that will bring a Native American speaker each year to the UNL campus. The Claire M. Hubbard First Peoples of the Plains lecture is designed to help advance the understanding and appreciation of the cultural heritage and the contemporary life of the First Peoples. The Hubbard Lecture and associated events, as Daniel mentioned, are made possible by the generous contributions from Dr. Ann Hubbard and the Claire M. Hubbard uh, Foundation. It's been a real pleasure for me in the last few years to get to know what the students, who the students call Dr. Annie, Dr. Annie, if I may. Um, uh, Dr. Annie not only gives of her resources for events like this, but also gives her personal time as a volunteer and mentor at the St. Augustine Indian Mission. And I also had a chance to meet um, Anne's mother, uh, Claire Hubbard, um, and both of them were, were very active in um, the philanthropy. Am I doing something? Oh, that's what I'm doing. It's me, I thought, I thought there was an unusual rattlesnake in here or something. <laughs> We were just hearing a story about rattlesnakes. With, I thought, this is a well. This is a little bit of the state museum. Come to, <laughs> come to Sheldon. Thank you. I figured somebody would tell me what was wrong eventually. Okay, all right. I will stand apart. As I was mentioning, the Hubbard family very patient with the director of the museum, and also are very active um, in philanthropy in Nebraska, and they have supported the university. Of, the, of Nebraska over the years, uh, the Medical Center, uh, University of Nebraska Omaha, uh, the State Museum, UNL, um, and our branch museums at Asheville and Trailside. Uh, in addition to tonight's lecture, I wanted to mention that um, the Hubbard Endowment is also making possible free admission for the whole weekend to Morrill Hall um, and uh, trying to make it possible for everyone to come see the First Peoples Gallery. And we're also going to have a special family program uh, tomorrow afternoon for uh, family activities with a real teepee put up by Mark Swetland from the Department of Anthropology. So it's uh, really with a tremendous amount of uh, pleasure and honor that I would like to introduce Ann Hubbard. Please help me thank Ann as she comes to the podium. Well, thank you for coming. I was flying back from Washington yesterday and trying to think of what to say. And the friend that I was with said, well, remember, Ann, just say something from the heart. So uh, what I would say is my heart was out there dancing tonight with the children from St. Augustine Indian Mission. So uh, my mom has been a supporter, or had been. She's deceased now. She had been supporting the Indian Mission when I moved back here in 05. So I went up there to see what was going on because I needed just something to do besides just being a physician. Uh, so uh, I met uh, a wonderful group of people up there, ended up adopting a classroom, which was a first grade classroom. And I go up there every two or three weeks and spend a day in the classroom with them and have been doing that now for six years. So we are moving up through school. I would say that my grade school, redoing grade school is a lot better than the first time around. <laughs> so uh, I'm doing a lot better this time. But anyway, I, you know, those kids have been wonderful. And I've worked with mentoring and kids all my life. But these kids have had the biggest impact of any group of children that I've ever worked with. Um, and with that, they also brought to my life, uh, you know, people in the Native American community that I would have never otherwise gotten to meet, which have just been amazing and also people that work for the betterment of children, uh, not only Native American, but uh, children throughout the, uh, uh, the communities. So when I, it was kind of by accident that I heard that the, Native, the State Museum was going to be uh, redoing the, uh, the display over there. And I'm like, oh man, this is an opportunity maybe for me to get some more publicity for St. Augustine's Augustine Indian Mission. And so I said, well, if you will have the kids dance and put their photos up there, I will help you fund this. So um, nothing is free, I guess. Um, and so uh, get, 
just so many things have come together and we were having lunch today. There's so many connections and so many wonderful people that I wanted that exhibit to be really alive and that there be an annual lectureship. That it's not just the history of Native American culture, but there are really fabulous things going on in current uh, Native culture. So I hope we get to share on that. Well, we've spoken about the Native American Gallery in Morrill Hall, and we have just a short video that's been put together by the University of Nebraska Foundation. Uh, and we're going to see the curator, Alan Osborne, and our chief consultant, Judy Gashkovich, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, in the video. So if I can do this properly without setting off other rattlesnakes. Well, the goals that we wanted to accomplish with this gallery uh, included telling a story about Native Americans. This story is about their life on the land, uh, beneath the sky of the Great Plains. Oh, look at so often Indian people, the Native American community, we feel invisible, we feel as though we don't have a voice. So to come here and know that this beautiful exhibit exists it gives us a sense of belonging, that this is our homeland and that we are visible and our stories can be told. The importance of the First Peoples Plains exhibit is for Nebraskans and Americans to know their history, they have to know ours. And without that being a part of this museum, well, the truth wouldn't be told. Our voice is here through this exhibit. Exhibits in this gallery will provide the public with a more dynamic view of Native Americans, and in particular to provide uh, information about Nebraska's heritage, the Native Americans who've lived in Nebraska, who currently live in Nebraska, um, through time. Uh, we have a number of traditions for Native people that include foodways, modes of dress, body adornment, transportation, so forth. And we're trying to uh, provide information about why those traditions were formed, why they persisted, and in some cases, uh, changed. This exhibit will undergo change. It will not remain static. Uh, for example, we have exhibit drawers that include artifacts from our collections. More than 90, 95 percent of the material that the museum possesses in their collections are not on exhibit. So we're hopeful that we can rotate new artifacts through these exhibit drawers that we have provided in the gallery. We've tried to make use of some interactive media, uh, flat screens and so forth that will be more dynamic, uh, that will change through time, and that will reflect sort of the dynamic life of Native Americans. We're looking at the past, but we're also looking at the present, uh, the present day lives of Native people. This exhibit really is holistic and it does reflect our people from then until now and into the future. And this exhibit reflects the resilience of our people and that although we've lost some stories and parts of our culture, much of it has been retained. I'm especially pleased to be a part of the First Peoples exhibit and I'm so grateful to Ann Hubbard, the donor, this gift, in that we were able to include the past, present, and the future through the Claire Hubbard lecture series. This new exhibit uh, will go on and keep us alive as we are.
Well, I hope you'll all come over uh, tomorrow to Morrill Hall to enjoy the activities. And uh, now, Judy, if you'd come up, I'll be doing your introduction. Uh, it's now my honor to introduce Judy Gashkabash, who is the Executive Director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs. Judy has held this position since 1995, and she's a national leader in Indian Affairs. She's a member of the Ponca Tribe, and Judy received the prestigious Sower Award in the Humanities from the Nebraska Humanities Council last year. As you saw in the video, Judy was our principal consultant for the First People of the Plains Gallery, and Judy's been very active in helping us with the Hubbard Committee planning for tonight's event. Judy? Thank you so much. I think tonight is going to be a magical night for all of us. Uh, in your program, there is a brief bio about our uh, keynote speaker. So I'm not going to really uh, read all of that, but I would just like to add a little bit about uh, Jossie Ross that I think will be interesting and then tell you a little story that might be humorous. And uh, I think you'll, I hope you enjoy it. Jossie's maternal grandfather gave him his Indian name, Uni Kumsika, which I probably mispronounced, <laughs> which means little big man because Jossie is very inquisitive and he has a conversational style that reminded his grandfather of an old man. Now Jossie tries to use these gifts to find ways to push businesses and individuals to be more ambitious, more knowledgeable, to ultimately make them more successful. Jossie comes from a family of storytellers and community leaders and he works hard to carry on the legacy. Yet despite being a graduate of Evergreen State College and Columbia Law School, Jossie wants others to know writing and documenting their own histories does not take an Ivy League education. And last night I had the pleasure of having Jossie over for dinner with the Unite students and we visited about his life uh, growing up on the Blackfeet Reservation and now he lives over uh, near Seattle uh, on the Suquamish Reservation. And he talked about magic and did I believe in magic? And I said, uh, yes, I do believe in magic. And I think that this whole process of how we've come here ha has been magical. As Dr. Ann Hubbard was coming back to Nebraska, my daughter, Katie Morgan, was leaving Nebraska and going to New York City to go to law school. And it was very scary for me to let my daughter go to New York City and to go to Columbia, where Jossie was in his third year of law school. But at the time, my daughter told me not to worry, Mom. She said, I'm going to be staying with this really nice person, Jossie Ross. So I'll be fine until they get me a dorm room, because this all happened kind of quickly after she was down in New Mexico at the Pre-Summer Law Institute. So I said, okay, that was great. I was so happy that she was going to be staying with this nice native person. Little did I know that this person was not a girl, as Ty thought Jossie Ross was tonight, but instead was a little big man, a very tall, handsome, six foot four, Blackfoot Indian man. And I am so thankful that the Creator brought him into our lives and that he was there to mentor my daughter. And uh, it was just uh, so wonderful. So after Jossie graduated and went on, and then my daughter did as well, uh, they went on their different paths in life and their law practices. I stayed in touch with Jossie. I would read about him in the Indian Country magazine, and I would send him little emails of encouragement and say, thank you, I'm thinking of you and praying for you. And my daughter, Katie, said, well, geez, Mom, you're better friends with Jossie than I am. <laughs> so now, all these years later, uh, last year, I was blessed to meet Jossie and to get to see and hug this wonderful, amazing person that is going to bring magic here tonight to all of you. So it's, it's such an honor for me to have been a part of this, and I publicly get to thank Jossie for what he did for my daughter. And I think that he has many more great stories to tell, and please enjoy this magical evening. We will.
I don't do magic. <laughs> Disclaimer. <clears throat> um, yeah, I wish I did. My, my son, I have a six-year-old son, and he, he's into magic. He, David Blaine. Now, this has nothing to do with the speech whatsoever. But he, he has, uh, he's into David Blaine. Unfair because my son, I'm Superman in my son. has any suggestions, um, please, please let me know. I, I want to talk about mentorship. That's going to be the topic. But I want to um, start off, first of all, in um, Blackfeet fashion, which is my tribe, the Amskapi Pukani people. And we, we start off, first and foremost, sounds very sacred, very ceremonial by uh, thanking the people that cook. Thank you for the food, that was good. I, I was barely getting by. And no native ceremony is, is complete without food. It was the mic. All right, okay. Which, which button is it? Okay. Uh, the, 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 yeah. Yay, okay, there we go. And, and you know, secondly, you always give thanks because in historical times, when you traveled someplace, there was no assurance that you were going to be met with open arms, right? Somebody saw this, this big, goofy-looking Blackfeet guy, they'd say, hey, that's, there's dinner. <laughs> there, there's somebody we can you know, put to work. <laughs> and, and so you always give thanks to your hosts. And so thank you, everybody, for, for coming out here. Thank you to the Nebraska tribes. The very much, I, I appreciated the singing, um, the dancing, there's a little a uh, grass dancer out there, I'm a grass dancer, and it's, it's cool to see that the next generation of, of dancers, that's a form of um, our, our ceremonies that's passed down. Um, thank you very much to Judy. Thank you very much to Ann. Thank you to Priscilla, wherever you're at. Where you, hey, um, Alan, I mean, thank everybody. I, I've had an amazing time out here. You guys have really spread the table and made me feel welcome, so I, I truly appreciate that. Um, I want to start off with a couple of quotes, if you guys don't mind. I like quotes. Um, there's a guy, his name is John Mohawk. John Mohawk kind of contextualizes what I like to try to think that I do. He was a, um, a philosopher, and he explained life for Native people through what he called the three sisters, squash, beans, and um, corn. Yes, there we go. And he talked about how those things, that we, we see life cycles through the three sisters. Um, he had this quote, which kind of, I think, contextualizes my uh, approach and my idea on mentorship. And we'll talk more about the substance of that in a little while. But I thought this is um, incredibly pertinent. It says, cultures... So we have this talismanic word that people throw around now, culture. And oftentimes, people don't unpack what culture means. They just say, culture, culture, culture. Like, you know, it, Beetlejuice, right? You say it enough times, and this guy's going to show up. I'm a culture guy. <laughs> and, and so John Mohawk actually tried to unwrap what culture meant a little bit. He said that cultures are learned means of survival in an environment. Once again, cultures are learned means of survival in an environment. Our cultures transmit those learned means of survival from generation to generation. And so when I hear that, I kind of think of, uh, you know, John Mohawk's one of my favorite Indians. And, and I, I think of this, my favorite Indian, I, I think in comic book terms, I was a comic book nerd. And I think of this guy with the thought bubble, and he's pointing to a schematic, a, a, a blueprint of survival methods, survival maps. This is how you are going to survive from generation to generation. And then another one of my favorite Indians, he didn't know he was Indian, but he was one of my favorites. His name is Martin Luther. He also had a quote that I like. He said that 
Even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces. Are you guys familiar with this quote? Anybody? It's bad. It's a great quote. It says, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. That's heavy. That's heavy. I'm going to get back to those quotes in a little while. I just want you to kind of sit on those and let it, you know, swish it around in your mouth a little bit and see how that tastes. Um, I, I want to, you know, there was yesterday we had lunch and I had a few questions about why mentorship? Why mentorship? Why not talk about some of the, the hotter topics, the topics du jour in Indian country? Because that's what I do. I'm a writer. I, I practice law, but yeah, kind of, you know. I, just enough. I'm a writer. And I'm, I'm thankful to be a writer. So my job is to kind of navigate and to, to scope the terrain and see what's interesting and what people are talking about. And so why not talk about one of those topic du jour? I see you know, people talking a lot about um, mascots and redskins and stuff like that, right? And so why not talk about that? That would generate a, probably a lot more interest amongst young folks. Um, why not talk about the, the government shutdown? You know, that's how that affects Indian country or Indian law. Tomorrow evening, um, I'll be speaking at, or excuse me, Sunday, I'll be speaking at an Indian law conference. I hate those conferences. And the reason why I hate those conferences is for the same reason why I opt to talk about mentorship as opposed to mascots or as opposed to the government shutdown, or Indian law. And that's because I think, first and foremost, mentorship is something that Native people, ourselves, our country, our individual people within our territories have complete autonomous control over. We don't have to beg Dan Snyder or the University of Utah or anybody else to change their mask. That, that's not what we're doing here. We're saying we're taking control over this topic of mentorship. This is a field that we're going to occupy and we're going to do something about it proactively. That's self-determination. I'm a big believer in self-determination for our people. So that's first and foremost why I opt to talk about this and to try to focus on this topic as a career path. The second reason is that I think this is a little bit less objective, not empirical. The second reason is because I think that this actually, I, I come from the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, a place of about 70% unemployment. Like most very poor places, there's a lot of social problems that go with that. That's not a racial thing. That's not an Indian thing. That's a poor people thing. You go any place, you go to Appalachia, you go to any Indian reservation, you go to Southeast DC, right? You see a lot of the same problems amongst across demographics. And so when I think of, I, I just wrote a piece, I don't know if any of you guys heard a uh, uh, website called Deadspin, but I have a, I have a piece that's about, um, that should be up there tonight about the Washington Redskins thing. I think as a social equity issue, there's some, there's some value to that. But it's not something that stays on the frontal lobe of my mind. I, it's not a particular interest to me. Nor is the government shutdown, because if you have 70% unemployment on the place, obviously the government isn't working that well there anyway, right? <laughs> and so I think mentorship, in addition to being something that we can occupy that space and proactively do something positive, good about, in addition to that, it's something that will actually create tangible good. It will improve the lives of individual Native people and collectively improve the fate of Native people as a whole. Now, that sounds good. That's something I'm interested in. So that's why I choose to focus in that. Now, the title of this particular talk, um, you know, I'm not a title guy. I give pretty terrible title names. And they ask me, the brilliance of indigenous mentorship and the current crisis to Native communities when Native mentorship disappears. It's very ominous, very ominous, very heavy sounding. I, I, I don't know, I was on a polysyllabic uh, kick that night, so I, you know, I had a bunch of big words in there. But the words, they're, they're not necessarily hyperbole. 
I do think there's a crisis in mentorship, not just within the Native community, but globally. I'll explain why in a second. I think it's a provable fact. It's an empirical fact. Um, I think that first and foremost, you have a, um, a group of people, Americans, the subset of Native Americans, Native people, that's my people. So I take a primary interest in my community. That's the way I was taught. That's what mentorship is about, thinking locally, eating localized diets, eating or, or feeding yourself localized nutrition, whether it be spiritually or whether it be educationally, taking control of those places. Um, but I see a group of people, Americans, who are increasingly, across demographics, fatherless. That's a provable fact. Fatherless. And that's a problem. And amongst the Native community, we're not immune to that. There's, within Native communities, there's increasing fatherlessness. And so as a result of that splintering of the family, obviously there is no ideal family and nobody's less than as a result of having a single, I grew up with a single mother. It wasn't a less than experience. But it's a fact that children do need both healthy parents. You know, it, it, some people say, well, there should just be a man there. Well, no, that's not true. You don't want an unhealthy man in that situation. You would rather have somebody that's occupying that space in a healthy way. There's almost nothing worse, and I give you this, than a frustrated, feeling oppressed, pissed off man of color. That's not something you want. You don't want that in the home. You want somebody that's healthy, that's healthily occupying that space. So you have this fatherlessness problem, and then you have increasingly an expectation that people have to make more and more money in order to survive. So now you have two income homes in those homes that do have both parents there. And so as a result of that, you have, it's just chronological fact, less time with the children. All right, that's not the end of the world. But maybe that there is a problem there. And, and maybe the crisis begins from that point. And how do you show that a crisis happens? It seems like a term of art. Well, what if you can show empirically that people are indeed more hopeless in this particular generation? What if you can show that by means of proving with data about prescription pill use, antidepressants, alcohol use, drug abuse, consumerism, people living in debt? All those numbers are very real. People stimulating themselves with other things other than family where it appears that people have more discretionary income than they did previously, the happiness quotient is dropping, it's falling. People are trying to find things to do with their time. They're addicted to stimulation. How do you know that within the Native community? How can you say there's a crisis within the Native community? Because our suicide numbers are six times the national average. That's an empirical fact. Our alcohol and drug abuse numbers are increased Manifold over the national average. That's, na that's empirical fact. Well, we're still at that question of why mentorship? Well, couldn't that always be the case? Absolutely. It could have been the possibility that our, our, our communities have been depressed economically for a very long time. Maybe we always existed in these states where there was this level of hopelessness. But that's not the case. That's not what history shows us. How do you show that? By showing that our people, Native people, operated largely by faith. By seeing an unseen prize many years in, in advance. So, for example, we go back to treaty times. Uh, Judy's very, you know, the sovereignty project. These, I mean, these are teaching about treaty obligations, right? Treaties are all about faith. Treaties are all about blind faith. So what I mean by that is this. 1855, when my people signed their treaty, there's a decreasing amount of us. Almost all of us are dead, comparatively speaking. But our elders, 
our people who are entrusted with our safety. They meet with Governor Isaac Stevens. And they say, Governor Isaac Stevens, we don't really trust you. You're a white guy. And moreover, you're a white guy that comes on behalf of the government. You guys have lied to us for a very long time. Many, many, many times. But because I believe that my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren might have a possibility for this investment, for this hope, this prayer to vest with them, and that you might actually honor this, this promise. I'm going to sign this treaty, sight unseen. Keep in mind, in the year 1900, there was only 250,000 of us. We're looking like we're going the way of the dodo. We're going to be, you might not even have to honor this treaty because we're going to be gone. But we're going to sign this with the hope, with the belief that you are going to honor this and that my great great grandchildren are going to be able to benefit and have a piece of our homelands as a result of this act of faith, this step of faith that I'm taking right now. That's a huge act of faith. And that's the way our people operated. If you look back at the historical record, and this once again goes across demographics, because this is not just a crisis in the native community. This is a crisis amongst all communities. Within the black community, slavery times, things look pretty desolate. I don't know if Abraham Lincoln is going to free the slaves. I have no clue. However, I am going to keep on working. I am going to keep on honoring this life that I believe God gave to me. Just like Native people said, I'm going to keep honoring this life that I believe the Creator gave to me with this hope that my community, my small group of people, my relatives, the people who are dependent upon me, they need me. If I do what most people do in hopeless situations, when hope is completely gone, as Toni Morrison suggested in Beloved, suicide, self-destruction. You kill yourself because what's the point, right? If I do that, then my people suffer because that's one less person to go hunt. That's one less person to go discipline the ch children. That's one less person to go be a seamstress. That's one less person to go gather medicinal herbs and berries and foods. So my community needs me. Therein lies the crisis of the lack of mentorship. That when there is no mentorship, when there is no sense of purpose, people take away this sense of belonging. Then all of a sudden you have no obligation to a larger collective. And that's the provable fact about mentorship, that a lot of people, but specifically Native people, have begun to lose that sense of community, have begun to lose that sense of, I owe this community something. I don't necessarily know what it is, but existentially, I feel like my purpose is to be a part of this. And so in, when I'm not doing this for my community, that has been ingrained into my DNA for tens of thousands of years. And that's important, that it's been ingrained for tens of thousands of years, that I've done this exact ta task for the benefit of my community. Then I start filling that time and that energy instead with stimulation. I start filling that time and energy with, with drugs, with alcohol, with materialism, and that's the circular cycle that is when there is no mentorship. Now, when we're talking about um, mentorship, it, it, we should get a little bit specific, right? That's the introduction. Um, we should start to talk a little bit specific. And, and so I want to you know, give you guys a few topics about mentorship, because we have to talk about what it actually is. Mentorship, first point, if you guys are taking notes, I don't suggest that I never took notes. Um, but if you are, Mentorship is not parenting. It is not servitude. It is not a get out of jail free card. 
Does anybody know where the term mentor came from? This is a question. Anybody know where the term mentor came from? Yes. Okay, good. That's a good person to learn it from. She said she learned it from me. That, that's right. Um, the, the, the term mentor, Greek mythology. Any Greek mythology people here? That's my dude right there. Odysseus, who later went on to Odyssey, hence the name. You know. he, he had a partner, and his partner's name was Mentor. That was his buddy's name. And Mentor was instructed when, when um, Odysseus left to go fight the Trojan War. When he went left to go fight the Trojan War, he left him in charge of Telemachus. He said, you are going to raise this boy, this son, as if he were your own. You are going to be in charge of him. You are going to reward him. You're going to discipline him. You're going to treat him almost exactly like he was your own child. Now, when we think of mentorship in the modern context, we don't think of it like that. We think of colleges. I'm going to go tell this person how they get into law school, how they, how they get into business school, how they make a billion dollars. And that's not what was in mind at all. It was a much more comprehensive thing. It said, I'm going to be the person that has very, very uncomfortable conversations with you. That's part of the commitment. I'm going to have very uncomfortable conversations with you because a parent, I have a six-year-old son now, a parent can't do everything. I think of my relationship with my own parents. I'm still waiting for the birds and bees talk. <laughs> That's how the kid came from. I, 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 I'm still waiting on the how to manage your money talk. I'm still waiting on the death talk. How do you talk about life insurance? Little, small, incremental Boring stuff that somebody who's in place there as your father or your mother that you trust that much with that level of capacity. They have those conversations. And I think within the native community, specifically on the reservations that I live, I try to be that person. I try really hard to be that person because I realized when I was growing up, there was a guy. Is that me? There, there was a guy, his name was, uh, his name was Ronnie Kicking Woman. And Ronnie Kicking Woman, when I was growing up, I wonder how he got that name. I don't want to inquire too much. I, as a family name, you never know. But, but this guy was he, he was, he was bad. He was a boxer. He was big. And Ronnie was like the boogeyman. I remember one time we were shooting BB guns. And I shot a BB gun and it reflected off the, off the a driveway and it broke a window. And we took off running. And Ronnie had eyes all over the place. He was big brother before big brother. This is George Orwell stuff. And I was amazed how swiftly his hand of justice reacted. <laughs> now, the thing was, Ronnie wasn't doing it as a thing to protect his own interests, necessarily, because it wasn't his house. He said he saw me doing something that was acting de to the detriment of the larger community. And he responded. He came over there. First of all, he spanked me. And then he dragged me by the ear. He didn't hide behind his work. Dragged me by the ear, knocked on our trailer, and told my mom exactly what happened. He was courageous. He was willing to take a step. Now, I'm not saying they should do that to kids or anything like that. Don't read too much into it. My point simply is that he felt a vested interest. He knew if that they were these knuckleheads out there shooting windows out in other people's houses, eventually we're going to get to his house. And eventually we're going to knock out his window and he needed to protect the community at large. He took accountability for the larger community. Now, when I look in our community, but I also look at other communities, and when I see something going on, whether it be there's instances of, of somebody breaking into somebody's house, um, the police come, things like that. You know what the reaction is that I see? And this is in my work, 
both, this is anecdotally, but also in my work as a defense lawyer. I'm a defense lawyer from time to time. I see people drawing their curtains, people hiding from the wrongdoing, people not taking a vested interest in what's going on in their community. They're dashing from the scene of the crime, unwilling to involve themselves. That is the opposite of mentorship. That is the opposite of being a concerned community member. Because you're saying, unlike mentor in the story of Odysseus, this does not involve me. Native people are not immune to this. We've started doing this as well. That is something that, that's why there's a crisis. Because a lot of our people are pretending that we don't see the dysfunction that exists within our own communities. That's dangerous. Um, the genius part of, of um, mentorship, of native mentorship, See, mentorship is literally, literally in our DNA. We couldn't have made it to this point without it. Alan and I were speaking earlier. Great conversation. And it was cool because we were in the museum. It was very appropriate that we were in the museum. And we were talking about, other than the fact that it was all, you know, you need to highlight black feet a little bit more. You know, right? But other than that, it was, it was, it was an amazing conversation. And we're, we're up there, and he's talks, talking about seamstressing and how vital it was to Native people's survival. And if you think about it, other than smartphones, needles are probably one of the biggest, uh, most important inventions of, you know, in mankind. Without it, we wouldn't have clothes, right? We'd be walking around naked. Um, and, and so our people, this is the genius part, we had very specific societies. We had societies that were essentially guilds to develop a specialty, a special craft. So for example, we had a seamstressing society. These women, they did the, the best work. They were very, very crucial to the survival of the community because in these cold times and cold climates like where I'm from, you need warm clothes. You need people to do it right. You can't, as Alan was saying earlier, you can't have any sort of leakages in your, in your shoes because then you get hypothermia. Very important society. We had hunting societies where you learn the best techniques to not only get food, but to sustainably get food. Because what good is food if it's all gone the next season because you overhunted? So you had to go different places. You had to know where all the fertile hunting grounds were. You had warrior societies. These ones tend to get a little bit too much emphasis in this contemporary time, but they were very important as well because if you had people that were encroaching upon your lands, you had to be able to protect your citizens. It's very important. And you had to be able to do it in a competent manner, in a manner that helped your community. And every single one, another one that I, I, I like to, my family's a member of something called the Horn Society at home, and it's a medicinal society. It's somebody who healed. We were healing people. And so there was a great responsibility attached to each one of these tasks. You guys follow that? Great, great responsibility. It sounds very, very lighthearted. And the way a lot of people treat societies now, it is lighthearted. It's not a big thing. Not everybody's a part of a society. But at that time, think about this. There are stories in our community about people, members of these medicine societies, who did not get the proper learning. They did not get the proper mentorship, the proper teaching. It's a full-time job. That's your whole job during the day. Your whole job during the night is to understand and to learn this stuff. And they didn't get the proper teaching. And so as a result of that, when the time came and people, there was influenza that went around in the community, we don't, have the, we don't have the medicine to counteract that. The community dies. That group of people is no longer there. There's extinction. That's what kind of great responsibility I'm talking about. So our people saw fit to say, this is so serious 
that we are going to engage not just this new stuff that we read in the New England Journal of Medicine or whatever, but best practices that have been going on for tens of thousands of years that have kept our people alive, kept our people well for tens of thousands of years. This is proven stuff. It might not be empirical because it might not be in writing. However, the fact that we're still here in 2013 kind of shows it works. And here's the crisis to go back to it, is that we're getting away from those methods of teaching, from those immersive methods of teaching where we have localized stuff, localized food. When we talked about localized food just briefly earlier. There's a reason why that is sustained for thousands, that sustained our people for tens of thousands of years. Um, my family's members of something called the Suquamish tribe and the Blackfeet tribe. Salmon has a special significance to us. It breaks down much easier in our bodies. And that's because our body has adapted to it for a very long period of time. Buffalo meat also breaks down pretty easily in our bodies because I'm Blackfeet. And so when you start to realize that it has implications, not just theoretical, but this history, this 10,000 years of history, has, rep has implications for today, for the benefit of all of us. Uh, example of that is the, the you know, now gluten-free. That's a big deal, right? Anybody eat gluten-free stuff, products? Anybody? That's a question. Nobody. Well, that's a big deal now in health because people realize that a lot of groups of people were not farming. They weren't eating wheat. You know, they haven't been, it's, it's just a recently domesticated product. And most Native people are like that. We didn't, we didn't farm wheat, and yet we've been eating it. And so Native people have wondered why we seem to have, and this, this is a matter of empirical record once again, problems with diabetes. Why we have problems with obesity. Why we have problems with alcohol. Alcohol manifests itself through the wheat, right? We have an allergy. There's an allergen there. That's another example of like that historical discussion we had earlier of the distant past informing the present. This stuff has life today. It has vitality today. And if we would bother to listen to the voices of those ancestors that said, nah, you don't want to eat that stuff. That stuff is not good for you. We might learn a little bit. Um, the third point about mentorship, remember the first two. Number one is it's not parenting, like parenting. It's done somebody that's done in the proxy, as the parent proxy for this person that you want to mentor. I see the relationship that Anne has with, with the, the kids from the school. It's a powerful relationship. And it's something that you get the proper objectivity, you get the proper distance. You know, I was, my mom couldn't mentor me because I was a mama's boy. I could do no wrong. <laughs> Sometimes you need that distance, right? You need that distance in order to say, look, your kid's bad. <laughs> your kid's rotten. Number two, it's very, very important to um, remember that mentorship is in our DNA. That this is something that has existed for a long time and it's something that if we continue to, um, if we continue to cultivate it, it will bear benefits. So we're talking about all those social program, pro excuse me, social pro problems that exist within a lot of our communities, these poor people problems, those things will start to diminish if we try to embrace those voices of our ancestors in our past. The third point is that mentorship is not a cold clinical thing. I hear a lot about mentorship programs. I'm involved in some just because I want to be supportive. And they'll, they'll contact me, hey, do you want to be a mentor for this guy? And Yeah, sure. But that's not really mentorship. That's like tutelage. Mentorship is something that's much more organic. It's something that manifests as a result of an investment. And the reason why that is, is because mentorship, first and foremost, remember the story of Odysseus and Mentor and Telemachus. 
It was a relationship as if that person was your child. The crux of mentorship must be about love. It must be a labor of love. I have a book coming out. It's my little plug, but not really. You don't, don't, don't buy it. It probably sucks. But I have a book coming out called How to Say I Love You in Indian. And, I, you know, the story, I was, I was down at this a be- beautiful school down in Santa Fe. It's called the uh, um, Institute of American Indian Arts. I was down there. I was speaking to them. And there was, um, they have a huge library. And it's almost all native titles. It's incredible. It's beautiful. And I'm a nerd, so I'm up there looking at everything. I'm looking through everything, checking all the stuff. And about, I'm not that smart. I, I figured it out after a little while. About 45 minutes in, I, you know, there's books on native philosophy and, 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 and anthropology and archaeology and law and, and, and economics and all these different disciplines. You know what I did not see one time? is that a book on native love. And I thought that was an injustice. I thought that was an injustice because native love, in my experience, and also my recollection of history, is probably the most resilient. It's the most accepting and unconditional type of love that I've ever seen. And the reason why is because it had to be. It absolutely had to be. It takes absolutely no faith. It takes absolutely no work to love in really, really good circumstances, right? If, if, if you got a million dollars in your pocket and you got ice cream in your hand and life is good, God is good. But when you see your people coughing and dying, wasting away because of tuberculosis and influenza, and all of your people, you think that your people will be obliterated within a very short period of time. Yet you continue to press on and try to create some sort of structure through the ways of treaties and through the ways of societies and through the ways of creating a clan system, which you teach your children so that they know that they are supposed to reproduce with particular people within their tribe. Don't mess with that person. That's their cousin. Those are safeguards. That's love. That's love that's tested by a whole bunch of stuff. And that's what native love is. And so I thought that was an injustice. How could you not have a book about love? And so I I wrote this book, and it's all little cheesy love stories. And once again, don't even bother to Google it or anything like that. But it's I I wrote this, and I you know I started thinking about my relationship with my son. I started thinking about my relationship with my dad and my mentors, and the folks within my community that looked out for me. And I thought it was interesting. Love is something amongst specifically men to young men within not just Native community, but also people of color generally, black community, Hispanic community. Oftentimes, we know how ugly life can be. Oftentimes, those men within those communities are more interested in preparing their children, their young men, for the ugliness that life can be. We're going to make them tough. You're not going to be a sissy. Instead of saying, I love you, I'm going to give you unconditional love, and that's going to fortify you. And the reason why, if I, so I started reading his, you know, a little bit more history, and I st- it made sense to me. Because a lot of times, people within our communities, those, those 70% unemployed people, it's hard to feel like a real man, oftentimes. Follow me here. If we say, according to the Protestant work ethic definition of real manhood, is to provide and protect your family, Yet you live in a place where there's 70% unemployment or 75% unemployment. And there's no way that you're ever going to be able to provide for your family. You get to this feeling of, I guess I'll never be a real man. And so you internalize that thought and say, my son, if I have a son, is going to be beat down by life just like I was. 
he's not going to be a real man either. So I need to strengthen the outside so he can absorb these brutal hits from society that emasculates him. I need to prepare him for that brutal reality. And that's not mentorship. As much as I want to embrace, everybody wants their, just like my son wants me to be Superman. I want my dad to be Superman. I want my uncles to be Superman. But those guys who taught me that just being tough, to just tough it out, grin and bear it, although that's a very Indian thing, given history, we had to do that. That's not mentorship. Mentorship is doing things out of love. That I want to protect the larger whole, the larger community. Because that's what the basis of this is. I love my people so much that I'm willing to play my position in a small way for the survival of the community. Do you guys follow me there? For the survival of the community. And that's the reason why in these times of hopelessness, these times of dire straits, I'm not going to commit suicide. I'm not going to give in to hopelessness of drugs, despair, alcohol, materialism. I'm going to say, this really sucks sometimes, but I love my community. I love my children, and it's very important for me to, at this point, love stronger than ever, love more than ever. And sometimes the outcomes are exactly the same, because love is not this mushy, squishy emotion, this notion that, you know, you're supposed to hear Beatles love songs and stuff like that. It's, love is something that sets standards in the sand. It draws lines in the sand and says, I'm going to be strong for the sake of my community, for the sake of my family. That's the third point about mentorship. Mentorship should be out of love. When I see the, the amazing work that goes on at St. Augustine, see this amazing work that goes on um, with Judy and her kids, I realize that's out of love. Not doing that to try to teach these kids how to be millionaires and take over the world. That's not what mentorship is. It's about saying, I want to play my part within this localized community. I want to love my community better. And I want to play this, just this tiny part and try to make things incrementally better. It's not, it's not world changing in a vacuum. But if enough people buy into that, and go into this ancient concept of playing your position, of joining those societies. And when I say societies, I don't necessarily mean it in the historical sense. I do, mind you, I think it's very important to do that and to be very well acclimated with our histories. But I'm saying that in the sense that within all of our communities, whether it be native or non-native, there's functions. Those functions give two things. They give purpose and they give a sense of belonging. If there's a little old lady across the street that needs lunch every single day. I'm not a member of a formal society, but if I bring her lunch, I have a purpose. She depends upon me. She might not get her lunch if I don't bring it to her. Not only do, 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 does she have, do I have purpose now, but I also have a sense of belonging. I'm a member of that community. I'm invested in that community. It's very important for me to be there within that community. And I think, and I'm slightly idealistic, but I've seen this come to fruition in many senses. I've seen it in many scenarios, contexts, where people do, they're willing to play those small roles. They're willing to incrementally make life better. And it works. And it works. So in conclusion, Thank you guys. I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate you guys. This is um, academia, but the focus is on application. Oftentimes within academia, that was my frustration with academia, was I didn't necessarily see the connection between theory and application. And for a lot of people of color, just real quick aside, a lot of times people within poor communities do badly on standardized tests, right? And I have a theory on why that happens. We all come from hunter-gatherer cultures. It's connected, believe it or not. 
But we all come from hunter-gatherer cultures at some point. And poor people, that cause and effect between hunter and gatherer is very close. If you don't hunt in August and September and October, you're not going to eat in November and December and January. Where I'm from, the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, huge dropout rate. And the reason why is because it doesn't matter if I drop out of school in ninth grade or I go to graduate in high school, I'm still not going to get a job. The disconnect between hunting, hunting and gathering. So when I see these standardized tests, I realize our people, those poor communities, we have a very, very pronounced sense of cause and effect. That is, we don't see the application of taking this test that is in no way going to benefit us. How is that going to benefit us? It's a theory. There's no application to it. So I try to focus on the academic application side of these equations, wherein we actually have, going back to the opening statements, why mentorship? Why not the Washington Redskins or mascots? Why not uh, the, the government shutdown? Because this is something every single one of us in this room, including me, have ownership over. We can do something about this. There are organizations that are dedicated to this. There are needy people out there who need a sense of community, who need somebody to come in and mentor them, and not mentor them in a passive way, but mentor them in a way that is like Odysseus to his children, or to, to, to uh, Telemachus, when he said, I will raise you as my own child. I will give you this advice. I will teach you these, these hard conversations to have. So all of us have ownership over this issue. And that's the reason why I chose this topic, and that's the reason why I hope that you guys will engage more in mentorship. And you know, I'm definitely going to keep pushing this topic within the Native community. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys again, truly. This water, I didn't even know it was here. <laughs> Ready? Is it turned on? I'll see you later, Chris. Good job. OK, can you hear me out there? It's time for Q&A, so yeah. please, does anyone have any questions for Jossie? And wasn't he magical, as I said he would be? Up there. How often do you get to uh, talk to the in your your you know different things? How yeah. often do you do this? Um I do it a lot. You know, it's uh I, I divide my time. I try to I try to practice what I preach. And so my time is divided amongst um doing a little bit of law, would actually, which actually pays the bills. I, I tried to jump off that hamster wheel a couple years ago. You know, I was working for a law firm doing 70-hour weeks, and I realized um, that, as I was speaking to George the other day on the radio, that you know, at some point, people, I think, have bought the lie, including myself, that conflates materialism and material success with happiness. And then I realized, I'm not really happy. I'm just finding new ways to spend money that have, on things that really don't mean anything to me. And so at that point, I literally jumped, quit my job the next month and started practicing for myself. And I understand my position of privilege that I can practice for myself and make a living doing that. So I try to do about 20 hours of law a week. And the rest of the time is working in schools. I speak at a lot of schools and try to develop close and meaningful relationships, and specifically with, um, with uh, males, because I, I think that it's entirely feasible for um, you know, women to be mentored to men and, and, and men to be mentored to women, absolutely. But I also realize that fatherlessness is an increasing problem in this, in this nation, and so I, um, that I dedicate a lot of my time to that. And I'd probably go out and speak in, I mean, in a formal context like this, maybe three times a month, um, 
but you know, informally, I go to school probably three times a week. Up there, on the right. The question was, can you explain the crab barrel situation on the reservations? You know, I, honestly, and I mean this with all due respect, I think the, the crab barrel is a, is a cliche. Um, I, think that there's, um, I think there's absolutely people that are dedicated to doing nothing but bad. But I think those people are in the large minority. I think largely what you get now is you get people who, you know, I get people, because I put myself in a public space, and, I, and I'm fairly um, successful in, in regards to um, the individual model of success. And as a result of that, I think I rightfully you know, endure a certain amount of criticism. And I think that's fair, because I have a, a position of privilege. And you know, I, I, don't, I see when people critique me as a part, you know, that's one of the duties of the job. It's just like when somebody's a CEO of a company, you're going to get blamed. The buck should stop there. Um, having said that, you know, I think that, that you know, Native people, just like any colonized, I hate that word colonized because I think it's overused. I also think that it's a cliche. But I think that you know, we, we were joking around earlier in, um, in, in the museum. And I was, I was teasing around because Blackfeet are kind of the natural enemies of the crow. And there was a lot of uh, crow exhibit, crow stuff in the, in the, in the exhibits. And you know, I, was, I was teasing about how you know, there's just way too many crows. And crows, this is historical fact, were oftentimes very, very close to the Indian agents. And that was part of the, you know, the, the reasoning behind, the, the pathos behind the reaction to Little Bighorn and stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I think that sometimes people see success, you know, crows have done certain things right, and you know, other people, you know, they do certain things right, and there is a propensity to, to those people make bigger targets, I, th I guess. You know, it's always easier to go at somebody that's a very visible target. Um, you know, I, not as many people hate me as hate Barack Obama. The reason why, more people know Barack Obama. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people, more people would hate me if they knew me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, right, about four rows up there on the left. The tie. With the tie, long. Um, <laughs> um, regarding um, the optimum amount of time, I mean, there's no formula for it. There's no magic bullet. However, I think it's a matter of what you're willing to do and how much you're willing to be there, as opposed to how much you're actually there. What's the availability? Because most of the times when you're talking about mentorship programs, you're talking about people who are in very vulnerable states. And as a result of that, there's times when, you know, I have people who call me 2, 3 in the morning, and after they, I curse them out, I try to be receptive to what they're saying. I don't want to be woken up at 2 or 3 in the morning. But that's part of the commitment that I made to them. And once again, I think to the original intent. You know, the Blackfeet people have a, have a concept called the first uncle. I have 13 nieces and nephews. Yeah, as an uncle, the first uncle, you have an obligation to be there as the dad. And so you know, whether or not I want to be, I have to be. And you know, that's, a, that's a very big commitment. And similarly to the kids that I choose to mentor and who chose me, you know, I, I, it's a more a matter of availability as opposed to times. You know, we go three, four weeks sometimes without even talking. But when they need me, I got to be there. It's not a question. I, I, so I guess um, you know, the, the, I don't think there is an optimum amount of time. I think there's an optimum amount of, of uh, availability and willingness. I think willingness is probably the key. You know, with, with any person, you can't force them to confide in you, but you can be there when they need to confide in you. Um, regarding Katie, yeah, she, she's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, she, I mean, she's like always afraid of making too much noise and, you know, yeah, so. Friend. Well, 
I think the mentorship is still teaching those, you know, here, here, let me tell you guys a little bit about me. I try not to talk too much about me during these because I, I think I'm boring, you know. Um, most interesting thing about me is probably my Calvin and Hobbes book collection. Um, but I, I, my grandpa, my paternal grandpa died when I was um, 22 years old. And he was the last person. I was pretty independent. Um, I, I went through large periods, you know, reservation life, right? I, my dad, um, my biological father died of a drug overdose. My mom, she's struggled with addiction her whole life. And um, I, I, they kind of lost, I guess, the ability to correct me. Um, and I didn't really have anybody that would was fit that position other than my paternal grandpa. He was the last person who, if he said something to me, if he told me to jump, I'm going to say how high. And, you know, I, I, um, now I think about it in hindsight, I get really scared. Like, man, there was a lot of opportunities to really, really screw up, to really, really be in a bad position because I had nobody I had to listen to. You know, and so a lot of these mentorship ideas that I see are things that I wish that somebody had or somebody would tell me now. I wish somebody had the audacity to do these things, even as a grown man, to put me in my place. And so I think that there's never a position, there's never a place where you run out of um, a need for somebody to give you a stern talking to, as long as it's done with love. Once again, love is the underlying basis for all this. And I don't think you ever outgrow that. My grandpa, you know, it didn't matter that he, he, was, a, he was a tiny guy. It had nothing to do with size. It had nothing to do with age. It had everything to do with his willingness just to be honest. And so that honesty part about it, that as a parent to a child, once again, I think of the root of it, from Odysseus, given that, that obligation to mentor, to talk to Telemachus, how would you talk to your child in this situation? Sometimes those conversations suck. I, I, my little brother, who's 13 years younger than me, I have to have conversations with him that I don't want to have. You know, I, I've had to talk to him about he's, he's, you know, had different, you know, he's a kid. He's, he's had different, you know, goofy periods in his life. And I have to take, make it a point to we're going to have this conversation and we're going to sit here and we're going to be really, really uncomfortable. And I don't, I don't think you ever outgrow that. And, you know, the skills, um, I, I imagine they would start off with something about job skills. Because a lot of people coming out of, uh, out of you know, corrections have a hard time getting a job social services, stuff like that. And I think that people can offer, a, I, I visit prisons, I visit, visit native inmates in prison at a, um, at a, um, a prison called in Monroe, Washington. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for, you know, just a, a gentle but, but, you know, firm word, you know, like this is how you can do something better. Yeah. You know, uh, it's funny. George is, George is here right behind you. George is one of my organizers um, on the Obama campaign. I was one of the state directors in Montana for the Obama campaign in 2008. And, you know, people said the same thing largely about peop Native people voting and participating in elections. Oh, we can't get them to vote. And that's true, historically. But I think that we have an obligation to be more in creative in, in, in how we engage our people. And so that's exactly what you're asking. How do we engage? And I think one of the hooks is by referencing. One of the ways that I, I, um, we worked on in Montana you know, during elections, and my background was in elections, was how we tap into this historical obligation. The historical obligation to vote, for example, or of service was, you know, natives serve in the highest uh, the percentage of people in the armed forces. We have a long history of service. And so we start drawing those analogies. And that's the reason why these, with Alan, the society talk is so important. This is designed to talk and to entice and to give that hook and even a guilt complex to native people. You are supposed to be here. That's exactly what that's saying. There's societies here, you're rightfully supposed to be serving this function. If you're not, 
That's absolutely 100% your choice as an adult. However, you are in arrears of your duty. You're not doing your obligation. And I don't mind. That's part of that firm talking to. I, I think that you know, it's important to have these very honest conversations, and not necessarily in a, in a mean way, but to point out the historical truths of these societies. We had people that trained our children to make sure that it benefited the greater good. And if, you know, to the extent that you're not doing that, you know, let the shoe fit, you know, if, if it may. And, and that, that, that's part of the educational process. And that's the reason why I'm thankful. Thank you guys very much for coming out here. I, I, first and foremost, I, I really appreciate you guys coming out. And that's part of the educational process of, you know, this, this museum, this, this lecture series. When you hear American Indian studies and stuff like that, some people say, oh, that's soft social science and stuff like that. But that's part of why informing, why educating about Native stuff is so important because then you can tie in things like the society talk into our into these discussions and it will actually have a tangible benefit upon the community and it's not a soft science it creates and informs future action Absolutely. That's right. And happy. Asking so much. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. Yeah. It's good people to go to. <laughs> no, it, you know, it's it's amazing. The um, you know our, our young people. We were talking last night, as Judy referenced, we were talking about magic. And, um, you know, my family is, uh, is unabashedly superstitious. And children want to believe in magic. And they see evidence of it every day. You take a child to a ceremony, they're going to see stuff that you don't see. And, you know, I, I remember, I mean, I saw stuff as a kid that I don't see now. I'm more cynical. And... When you start to introduce this historical talk, this connection to their ancestors, it makes sense in a way that even if you don't necessarily understand it yourself, I tell my son a lot of stuff that I don't necessarily get. His mom is from Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico, and we go down for the Shalako ceremonies and we go down for, this, for the um, winter, uh, summer ceremonies. And <clears throat> I don't know, I, he asked me questions, I don't know a lot of the answers. But I know it's very important, number one, that he be there. And I know it's not important for me to be there, even if I don't necessarily understand it. That some of this stuff is simply magic. And that 
his connection with those ancestors who are there that are speaking to him and that he gets so excited to go down there and see the hoo-hoos and see the shaloko dancers that that connection is speaking to him. And so who am I? Why would I ever have the temerity to say that because I don't understand this? I'm going to be egotistical enough to say that you shouldn't go to that. I should just embrace that. And so if, you know, if, if my, our children want to have this connection and they want to go to Lakota ceremonies or they want to go to Winnebago ceremonies, I mean, we should encourage it. We should absolutely encourage it because that structure is coming from someplace very, very ancient. And most importantly, most ancient things, um, you know, survival is the ultimate test of whether something was effective or not, right? If it's not effective, either the practice dies or the person dies. And so the fact that those ceremonies are still alive obviously shows that it's been working, and so we need to introduce them to those ways of life. We have time for one last question. Right there. Like yesterday, I was visiting a relative in the hospital, and um, the room was getting overcrowded with a nurse and other visitors, and I went out into the waiting room looking for um, a young lady that I noticed um, walking around in a gown by herself, and I was thinking, gosh, is she by herself? Is she alone? Or, you know, where's her family, you know, and, and um, is she from here? And so I went into the waiting room and I went to the coffee, where the coffee was, and she was over there by the um, computer. And I thought, well, let me go over there and get some coffee and see if she notices me. So I'm over there and she's, look, and she still doesn't notice me, so I'm, back away and I sit back and I'm watching the TV for a little bit and all of a sudden, you know, I'm looking like, gosh, I need to, I want to, I want to brush her hair, you know, <laughs> because, you know, you're, you're laying in the hospital and your hair is all knotted in back and I was like, wow, I really want to brush her hair and why is she here? And, you know, what brought her here? And then finally I went over there, I finished my coffee, and I thought, well, I don't want no more coffee. Well, I'll go get some water. Maybe she'll notice me. So I went over there and got some water and kind of glanced over and looked at her, and I was like, she smiled, and I was like, hi. And she started, she said, hi. And I was like, where are you from? <laughs> and um, she goes, from South Dakota, I'm Rosebud. And I was like, oh. I said, so what brought you here? And she told me she had a major heart surgery. And I was like, what? She said I had a over, my heart was um, overgrown heart. And they had to cut me open. And, Tear my chest up, and I'm really sore. And I was like, "Oh, um, are you going to be here long?" And she goes, "No." Uh -uh. She said, "I'm going to leave tomorrow." I said, "Is there anything you need?" And she goes, "No, I don't need anything. I need fry bread." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, where are you going when you leave?" And she goes, "I'm going to." Um, um, to a facility, assisted living. I said, okay, well, I'll see you Saturday. I, I, I can get you some fry bread. And so I was sitting, I went home, and I was thinking, why did I want to be in touch with her? Why, that mother in me, I wanted to brush her hair. And uh, she had also mentioned to me, she said, yeah, she said, I seen you and your your um, sister, um, and I told my nurse when I went back to the room, she said, 
that's my relatives out there. I was like, you know, maybe it's our ancestors that come to us. Or maybe it was her mother that wasn't there to, to be there with her that said, go talk to her. You need to, you know, go brush her hair. Maybe that was her mom wanting her hair brushed, you know, and that. So, you know, our ancestors are here, and somehow they do speak to us. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I think that was a beautiful story to end with. And as Jossie says, there's the greatest stories are yet to be told, and through the First Peoples exhibit and the Claire Hubbard lecture series, I think we'll get many more opportunities to come together to share our stories and to uh, know that we have many things in common and we can grow and learn from each other and that we really uh, have more in common than we don't. And so I thank Jossie, uh, everyone here, for having us here tonight. And especially Priscilla, that she's going to be retiring but staying with us. And I never dreamt that we would be up here doing this, considering where we were. Uh, many years ago, right, Priscilla? Life is very interesting, isn't it? So it's wonderful. So safe journeys to all of you. Yeah.